Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, NASA announced a deal with Mastin Space Systems, whereby they were going to pay Mastin to deliver a bunch of experiments to the lunar surface in the next two years. This is a big step up for the small California company that's been hacking away on a series of rocket-propelled prototypes for the last 15 years or so. You might have heard about them because they won prizes at the Lunar Landing X Prize Challenge. Their zombie vehicle was the second one to complete the Level 1 Challenge. And their Zoe vehicle was able to complete the Level 2 Challenge and it completed it with better accuracy than Armadillo Airspace. So they won the $1 million prize for that. But since then, they've continued to develop their vehicles. Over the years, they have flown hundreds of test flights with their vehicles. All of them, by the way, the names start with the letter X. You have the Zombie with an X, the Zoe, the Zero, the Zero B, the Zodiac, the Zeus, and now the XL1, and also the XL1T. The T stands for terrestrial as opposed to the XL1, which will actually go to the moon. They are very hands-on in their design philosophy, so they want to be flying terrestrial test vehicles before they actually send one to the moon. After all, if you can master landing with six times the force of lunar gravity and crosswinds, you're probably set up for landing on the moon. So this contract is awarded under the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, or CLIPS, and it's for $75.9 million, which of course sounds like a lot of money to people like me, but as soon as you realize that this is going to include end-to-end -end processing and paying for the launch, it doesn't sound like a lot of money. But as I understand it, part of the plan is that there is room on the lander to carry third-party payloads, so they will be able to potentially sell that to other people that want to put stuff in the surface of the moon. And of course, they're not going to need an entire rocket for this. Ideally, they'll probably fly as a ride share, although they'll probably be the primary payload since they need to pick their window. They are, after all, going on a translunar injection towards the moon. Now, as for the question of which launch vehicle it would use, the payload user's guide they released last year suggests that the mass is about 2.7 tons when it's fully fueled. And if you want to throw that onto a translunar injection orbit, you can do it using a Falcon 9 with a drone ship landing. And it's also possible to do this with an Atlas V with no strap-on boosters. So it's well within the rockets that are there. But I think in terms of cost, you know, Falcon 9 is probably going to be cheaper. For both those rockets, the payload capacity to TLI is still only about 3 tonnes, so there's only a room for a few hundred extra kilograms. So the XL1 would ride as the primary payload, and there would be a small amount of room for secondary payloads that wanted to ride along and you know, subsidise the launch. However, I should also point out that the image that was released by NASA shows a hexagonal lander, and the payload guide from last year shows a very different lander design that is much closer to the XL1T. I think that they're using a similar architecture underneath it, it's just they've moved some stuff around and given this sort of 4 meter hexagonal design. For propulsion, the XL1 will use four main engines and 16 small reaction control thrusters. They're all going to run on a mysterious propellant called MXP351. This is a secret trademarked propellant that is developed by Mastin. It is way less toxic than traditional hypergolic bipropellants. As in, you know, you can have it sitting out in a container and it's a good idea to have a respirator when you're messing around with it. But otherwise, you know, you shouldn't worry about it too much, which is way better than, say, nitrogen tetroxide or, um, you know, hydrazine. According to Mastin, it gets a theoretical specific impulse of 322 seconds, which is pretty good, but not quite as good as the 336 seconds that nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine gets. On the other hand, it doesn't give you cancer or dry clean your lungs. We do know the engines are codenamed Machete, uh, which is in line with the other engine names, the Scimitar, Broadsword, Hatchet, and Katana. The Machetes uh, get a thrust of about 100 kilograms and can deep throttle by you know, to one fifth of that. And it looks like the terrestrial test vehicle will have bigger engines that are maybe four to five times more powerful. 
The layout of the ladder is also kind of interesting because they sling the payload areas either side of the three main tanks in the middle. And the idea is to put the payload as close to the surface of the moon as possible. So the basic layout is you've got three spherical fuel tanks lined up along the middle with an oxidizer on the outside and fuel in the middle. On top of this, you have the solar panels, the radiators, the other hardware that's required to service the lander. Uh, the engines are arranged around the outside, and of course you have the reaction control thrusters around that. But that is, of course, the XL1 that we saw previously. The new one is hexagonal shaped. It's probably sharing a similar design underneath this with just distri different distribution of radiators and other hardware. It's all solar powered, so it will be able to survive the lunar day. They don't expect it to survive a lunar night. So the mission is specced for 14 days, assuming that they land just after sunrise. It's also aimed for the South Pole, which, depending upon the time of year, they could certainly get a little more life out of it. Anyway, in addition to designing the landers that will go to the moon, they've also been investigating the science of landing on the moon. They've been working with a... Uh, university on investigating what happens to rocket plumes when they impinge on the surface because this is going to be a serious thing going forwards especially when we're considering scaling up the human landers to much larger sizes. When the Apollo spacecraft landed they did blast a few hundred kilograms of material off the moon but the kind of things we're talking about sending you know for the Artemis program are going to be displacing tens of tons or more, and some of this material will go into temporary orbits. So there's some great footage that they've published of experiments where they've been testing this in the Earth's atmosphere and looking at how the debris gets blown about. But even more interesting, this week it was also announced that they had been awarded a Phase 1 uh, NIAC, that's NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Award, to investigate something called FAST, that's Flight Alumina Spray Technique Landing Pad. The idea is that when your rocket is coming down, instead of having all the exhaust gas blow away the surface material, why not inject alumina into the rocket stream, have it melt, and then essentially spray paint the surface of the moon with the rocket engine spraying molten alumina to try and glue it all together before it reaches the surface. This is, of course, a fascinating concept. I'm not sure how the dynamics of this will actually work in practice, but it's absolutely worth trying because spacecraft going to the moon are going to have to solve the regolith problem. Starship is, of course, a prime example. It's the biggest thing that anybody's talked about landing on the moon seriously. And that is going to dig a huge hole, especially when you consider that they can't throttle those engines deeply enough you know, compared to many of the other spacecraft that we're looking at. If the goal of Artemis is more than flags and footprints, then you need to be able to land spacecraft in close proximity to each other. And the only time that's really been done was with Apollo 12 that landed close to Surveyor. And that didn't that did a lot of damage to the thing. They recovered parts of it just to examine just how it had been sandblasted. And that wasn't particularly close to the target. So this is one of many mitigation techniques that are being investigated, but I wouldn't be surprised if the ultimate solution is to just have spacecraft that land and kind of roll out a carpet over the surface for future landers. So it's great to see Mastin getting these awards, especially after what happened with the XS-1, how Boeing got it, and then they shut down the program deciding they couldn't actually do it. Uh, incidentally, the broadsword engine that they were originally planning for that did finally get tested by the Air Force over Christmas and it performed. So that's another cool thing they got. And of course, this also means that Mastin has their work cut out for them as they have about 20 months to put this mission together and get it all the way to the moon. And I wish them the best of luck. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.